from September 1996 and August 1997. Originally broadcast on NET, the political news talk network. Tonight on American Investigator. A battle for FDA approval of a revolutionary new eye surgery machine between two high-tech companies. A document leak. Was the FDA involved in a classic case of industrial espionage? That trust was broken by someone in the agency. Someone sent those documents to our competitor. Um, and I felt outraged by that. And find out why the FDA is harassing eye doctors for purchasing equipment overseas at a cheaper price, even if it's an identical machine to the one approved for the U.S. If the FDA prevails in this, they're going to be micromanaging everything in medicine, um, which will certainly slow us up even more in this country. Plus, allegations of a payoff to a key U.S. senator to speed up FDA approval. I asked Mr. Francis, I said, what happened next? He said, uh, Dave smiled, uh, opened uh, up his suit jacket and said, how do you want the checks made out? A medical exclusive with a political twist. Eye on the FDA, tonight on American Investigator. And now, here's the host of American Investigator, Paul Wyrick. Good evening and welcome to American Investigator. I am your host, Paul Wyrick, and tonight we have an exclusive story told for the first time on NET. Our report confirms what many of us often suspect, that a federal aid personal connections and favors, even at the highest levels. Here to tell us the story is NET's American Investigator team, Ethan Gutman and Marianne Lombardi. Marianne, you're beginning our report tonight, so what's in store for us? Thanks, Paul. Tonight's report takes a look at a laser eye surgery procedure under review by the Food and Drug Administration. Two competitors in the laser market were undergoing FDA review for their machines when a strange event happened, giving one company an edge over the other in a very profitable market. We begin tonight in Boston, Massachusetts. November 25, 1995, the day after Thanksgiving. A wealthy Massachusetts businessman picked up his mail. Among the bills and junk mail was a large packet. He was on his way out of town and in a hurry to get to the airport. While waiting for his flight, he sorted through his mail and opened the big packet. He threw the envelope away and put the papers into his briefcase. He didn't look at them again until the next day. Then he realized that the packet contained his competitor's blueprints formerly under lock and key at the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA. The man who received these documents was David Muller, founder of Summit Technologies located in Waltham, Massachusetts. The blueprints for the Star Exomer laser belong to a company in California called Vizix Incorporated. Mark Logan is Vizix chairman and CEO. I was outraged about what happened. We gave our most, most secret documents to them on the basis that they needed them to do a good job in our approval. That trust was broken by someone in the agency. Someone sent those documents to our competitor. Um, and I felt outraged by that. Two companies dominate and compete for an emerging market where billions of dollars are waiting to be made, a market that may help millions of Americans see better. Doctor, so we have a minus 125 sphere. Photorefractive keratectomy or PRK, can permanently correct vision, a miracle discovery for all Americans who want to throw away their glasses or contact lenses. There's uh, roughly um, 155 million Americans who need some form of vision correction. Uh, that could be the market. American investigator spoke with Leslie Latham, who was confined to Coke bottle glasses or contact lenses so thick they would scratch her eyes. Eye surgery offered a way out. I just put away my fear, fears, tried not to think about it, uh -huh. and went on with it. Did it hurt afterwards? Mm -mm. Didn't hurt at all. What was the first thing you saw? That clock right up there on the wall. 
And I told him what time it was. And I wouldn't have been able to see that clock up there prior to surgery. PRK is to eye correction what penicillin is to medicine. There will always be a need and there are plenty of profits to be made. The operation costs about $2,000 per eye and Vizix and Summit stand to split over $15 billion in profit. But that wasn't enough for Summit. To understand Summit's corporate culture, we spoke with many former Summit employees. Most were afraid to go on camera, but they reported remarkably similar stories of an aggressive, almost paranoid workplace. Possibly. Former Summit sales manager, James Fallon. Uh, there were many artifacts we had in the company, cups and slogans, uh, basically um, uh, being a very proactive or aggressive company to, uh, uh, Mr. Mueller said, this is our market and we're going to have uh, most of it, so whatever it takes to win, we're taking no prisoners, quote unquote. David Muller was at the center of it all. Once a college dropout and sewer pipe layer, Muller, fearless and determined, pushed his employees to win. Under his direction, Summit's turnover rate was about 40%. But Muller played favorites. His inner circle, John Francis, a close companion, and Kimberly Doney, Summit liaison to the FDA, both aided Muller in his offensive against Vizex. Despite their aggressive marketing plan, Summit had a problem. They were losing money, and though their laser to correct glaucoma, or the homium laser, had FDA approval already, the market was minute, and the machine only sold for about $30,000. But then came the Exmer laser. It was a huge potential market, and each machine sells for about $400,000. Yet nothing could be gained without FDA approval. The solution? In a memo to David Muller, former Summit Vice President for Strategic Planning, Stephen Blinn, pitched an idea. Although the U.S. market is realistically several years away from FDA approval for PRK, creative packaging of the laser might be the answer. By strapping on the homium to the eczema, we could pre-sell the entire eczema, say minus the tube and maybe the optics. How much of this workstation was actually an eczema? And how much was a homium? What was the problem with that? Well, the problem was uh, under the FDA law, you are prohibited from marketing, promoting, and selling a medical device unless it uh, receives authorization or approval to sell and uh, Summit clearly did not have that. The memo continues. I believe we should file for the homium and don't mention anything about the eczema. The FDA will not even recognize that it is in effect authorizing the pre-sale of an eczema. We were told in writing, uh, both distributors, uh, sales organization people and corporate staff, never to put in writing uh, the word eczema uh, that we were pre-selling the workstation with eczema capability. The memo mirrors Fallon's remarks. We must adhere to a strict policy of controlled communication. We don't want the FDA to have any summit paperwork to come back to haunt us. Officials from Summit have claimed the memo is a forgery, but Summit's actions suggest otherwise. It's uncanny that the issues in that memo seem to be true, accurate, and forthright. I know of no false statement in the memo. What, um, what was written in it has come to pass. What the memo describes is what happened. Okay. And um, I, I don't know whether it's a forgery or not, but in, in many ways, it's a brilliant, mar it's illegal, but a brilliant marketing plan. There's no doubt about it. Was the risk worth it? Look at what Summit had to gain. You're talking in ex approximately a quarter of a million dollars uh, uh, pre-net profit to the company per laser. Summit was selling these workstations, homiums, for I think three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars. Now the effect on us was these are potential customers for us who already had spent four hundred, let's say four hundred thousand dollars, and certainly are not available for us to uh, market to, because they've already made that commitment. 
The Blinn memo concludes with Summit's ultimate goal. Within six months of approval, we could capture 70% of the entire market. VizX perceives this pre-FDA approval period as one of just waiting. While VizX is sleeping, let's slay the dragon. Where was the FDA while Summit sold over 100 of these workstations? To some, this story sounds like a tale of two companies, and that's just how the Wall Street Journal reported it in a front page feature article. But they didn't tell the whole story. This is about FDA favoritism towards Summit and a pattern of corruption that will be revealed as we bring you the evidence. Paul? Thanks, Marianne. We have to pause for a break. When we return, think your doctor has the freedom to buy FDA-approved medical equipment whenever he chooses? Well, think again. Coming up, how one eye doctor's use of an imported Summit machine has caused a conflict with the FDA. Well, I had a uh, simple country doctor here. I hadn't been into the halls of uh, big government before, so this was kind of uh, an eye opener. Stay tuned. American Investigator will return after these messages. And welcome back to American Investigator. Our report continues tonight with NET's Chief Investigator, Ethan Gutman. Ethan, where does the story go from here? Well, Paul, uh, no device, no matter how ingenious, can be sold without the FDA's stamp of approval. How then does a company get approval from an agency which holds all the cards? It has to submit a pre-market approval application, or PMA, and then it must have submit clinical data using human subjects who have actually tried the procedure. Yet, in Summit's case, the FDA inaccurately monitored the human subjects, a decision that may have blinding consequences. The FDA is known for its careful, some critics would say over-careful, approach to medicine and device approval. Yet in Summit's case, the FDA's usual standards appeared to slip significantly. Summit's U.S. clinical data for PRK approval totaled over 1,600 moderately successful cases. But a different picture has emerged in Europe and Israel, where the device has already been in use for several years. Respected ophthalmologists are having problems, specifically with high rates of retinal detachments and always with Summit machines. The data that Summit presented, 1,600 cases, contain no retinal detachments. Is this plausible? In his explanation of VizX procedures, Mark Logan brings up another crucial problem. We intentionally aimed for a slight undercorrection to leave the patient slightly myopic, very slightly. Um, and that's because there's a bell curve. And I'm sure from the school days you remember the bell curve. It looks like a bell and it sits over any point. So if you aim for emetropia or 2020, the middle of that bell curve is right over 2020. On either side is an equal number of patients who are undercorrected and overcorrected. The problem is the overcorrections. We did not want to overcorrect anyone uh, because right now there's no um, ability to bring them back in and retreat them. In an attempt to forge ahead in the laser market, Summit sought FDA approval for an enhanced procedure. But again, it needed more clinical tests. Summit was rushed and presented only 89 full-term cases, half of them naval personnel, average age 33. In top physical condition, they were hardly a representative sample of the population. Even more disturbing, an estimate of the overcorrection rate went as high as 47%. Corneal damage may have been present, but these effects will not surface until these men are in their 40s, long after FDA approval has been granted. Good job. We're done. Doctors are at risk, too. When the laser strikes the eye, it creates a fine mist of tissue and blood, exposing the doctor to infectious diseases. Vizex made a laser evacuator standard in their machines, essentially a high-tech vacuum tube. Will Summit ignored the problem? Should the FDA have ignored it? And why the bias towards Summit? 
Let's take a closer look at the FDA's inner structure. At the top is Commissioner Dr. David Kessler, the man to whom all FDA employees answer. Known to do Dr. Kessler's heavy lifting is Director Dr. Bruce Burlington. Dr. Nancy Brogdon manages ophthalmic devices, the section where reviewer Emma Knight controlled Summit's application. Knight plays a key role getting Summit to approval. And remember Kim Doney, Summit liaison to the FDA? Multiple sources confirmed that Knight and Doney had a close personal relationship. There were extended conversations and private dinners. Knight reportedly leaked a highly confidential letter indicating that Summit approval was imminent. Summit's stock soared. When Summit finally did get its approval, Knight was seen at Summit's celebration party. Was Doney's relationship with Knight instrumental in getting Summit's PRK application approved six months before VizX? And why didn't FDA management intervene? Let's contrast how the VizX application was handled. Enter Dr. Mark Stern, a new hire with 13 years of clinical ophthalmic experience to head up the VizX application review. But Stern may have been hired to fail. As he spoke to American Investigator, he recalled his interview with Nancy Brogdon. During that interview, she suggested to me that it would take at least one year prior uh, with, uh, with experience in the division before I could come up to speed and contribute significantly to the workload that the division uh, did in ophthalmic devices. Stern was given no training. His supervisors were transferred to other departments, including Emma Knight, who took the summit application with her. Stern threw himself into the VizX application. How quickly, or how long did it take you to complete the VizX application? From um, the middle of July until the end of uh, September. But when the VizX application was brought to the panel that would authorize final approval, an obstacle emerged. One of the panel members was a new reviewer also, who seemed to be rather upset by having to do the review. She was also a substitute reviewer for the originally scheduled reviewer, who was not accommodated on the day of the review of the panel uh, meeting. That panel member was Dr. Marion Maxai, the lone dissenting voice against Vizex. At the meeting, she used privileged technical information believed to have come from Emma Knight. What is Dr. Maxai doing now? She is now a uh, laser uh, investigator for Summit Technologies, the major competitor of Vizex, and she has received a free loaner device uh, for this study. After the Vizex panel, events accelerated. Mueller received those blueprints we told you about earlier. Rumors started of a congressional investigation. Stern was given an involuntary transfer, and that information leaked, somehow, to a Wall Street analyst. In frustration, Stern made an attempt to meet with Dr. Kessler to inform him of improprieties and the stealing of FDA documents. Instead, Stern was met with a new directive. I was told to immediately leave FDA premises, take all my personal belongings, and to sign out at Park Loan, which I did on January 30th, and I voluntarily resigned rather than being fired. Did you ever get that meeting with Dr. Kessler? I never got the meeting with Dr. Kessler. Dr. Robert Dotson of Tennessee has had his own problems with Summit and the FDA. Dotson was simply eager to treat his patients with eczema laser surgery, and with a limited budget, he imported a used Summit laser for $100,000 rather than buying a new domestic model at $400,000. There was no clinical difference between the two machines. Summit's own FDA testimony admits this. An additional twist, all domestic machines produced by Summit and Vizex have a built-in debit card slot. The machine won't even operate without collecting a $250 fee for every eye. Potential long-term profits, $15 billion for Vizex and Summit. The imported machines don't have a debit card slot. So Summit, using questionable clinical evidence, sued doctors for importing machines. One of, the, uh, one of the ophthalmologists in the suit uh, was talking with his lawyer and they were, he was all excited because he'd won, you know, and uh, what his lawyer told him, uh, uh, Bill says, uh, don't get too excited because now you have to worry about the FDA. He said, this is a very powerful company. And uh, sure enough, <laughs> within about three or four days, bang, oh, there's an import alert. <laughs> 
Threatening import ban letters from the FDA have become routine. David Mueller follows them up with his own letters. We just received a copy of the warning letter the FDA sent you. Have a nice day. Representing the doctors under fire, Dr. Dotson met with the FDA on their home turf. Well, I had a uh, simple country doctor here. I hadn't been into the halls of uh, big government before, so this was kind of uh, an eye-opener. In the meeting, the FDA stonewalled. She said, well, thank you for coming and so on, but we're, uh, we're glad you're here, but we're not going to discuss any technical issues today because you didn't tell us that you wanted to discuss technical issues. Now, we had spent weeks, and our lawyer pulled out his letter, you know, and held it up and said, how about this? And they just ignored that like it was nothing. If the FDA prevails in this, they're going to be micromanaging everything in medicine, um, which will certainly slow us up even more in this country. Well, Ethan, there's certainly a pattern of favoritism here in the FDA, but how high in the FDA structure does this favoritism go? Well, Dr. Maxai probably couldn't have replaced an established reviewer without Burlington's approval, so that's one clue. There's a second clue, which is we have a highly credible source who does not want to go on camera, who claims that he overheard uh, Burlington and Mueller having a conversation in a social situation in which Mueller said, uh, I'm sorry, Burlington said, you're a greedy uh, guy, and he said this in a very intimate way. And uh, then the question is, how uh, is Kessler involved? And the next segment should uh, shed some light on that. Okay, when American Investigator continues, getting on the fast track to FDA approval could be easier than you think. Coming up, FDA approval normally takes several years but not if you know the right people. If they don't get the truth and they don't find the guilty party and they don't put in place procedures to minimize this happening again, there is no integrity in the review process at the FDA. Don't go away. American Investigator will be right back. And now, back to American Investigator. Given the close relationship that existed between Summit employees and FDA employees, let's take another look at Mueller's story. The FDA admits that the document came from inside their agency. Mueller's official statement claims that he threw away the envelope at the airport, not realizing the document's significance. Yet suspicion about Mueller's story is widespread in the optical device industry. If you received a large packet of material, organized, indexed, labeled, would you throw away the envelope, think it was junk mail? <laughs> well, I certainly wouldn't think it's junk mail. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, uh, I wouldn't do that. Uh, and uh, given that it's not junk mail, I obviously, uh, curiosity would, I would start looking at the envelope, see where did this come from? And the envelope would be one source of that. It must have had a postmark on it. Where was it mailed from? Uh, of course, if, as you think through that, you might say, Maybe that's fingerprints on it as well. The timing in Mueller's story accomplishes one critical mission. It gets rid of the envelope. In contrast to private homes, airport trash is removed every day. An envelope quickly becomes irretrievable. But what if the envelope never existed? Suppose Mueller already had the documents and this was about to be revealed. Congressman Joe Barton, head of the House Oversight Committee, is holding hearings on the document incident. The committee has learned that Emmonite's fax address appeared on some of the documents. Whoever did it had to, be, had to know exactly what they were doing and had to be very careful how they were doing it uh, and also had to have enough technical knowledge to, to, uh, to know what needed to be sent. Top FDA personnel have admitted that the document originated internally, but will not comment on Emmonite's role. In fact, both the FDA and Summit ignored Barton's request to testify. Mr. Logan testified and suffered immediate FDA reprisals. Perhaps it's coincidence. We, uh, while I was in Washington, um, preparing for the uh, testimony, um, I did receive a call from my my uh, people here in uh, Santa Clara, that there was a surprise uh, inspection by the FDA. 
and the FDA has continued to stall. They've been, they've been almost totally uncooperative. I don't know what, what uh, Dr. Kessler or, or Dr. Alpert or Dr. Burlington, who are the top three people, officials at the FDA that would be over this issue. I don't know what they know and when they knew it. But if in fact they knew, if they, if they know who, who committed the crime and are handling that information either to the subcommittee or to the Justice Department or the Health and Human Services, then that would be a cover-up. American Investigator contacted the FDA for an interview and we were told we simply won't talk about this. The FDA's pattern of favoritism to the point of ignoring their own rules of conduct and their pattern of evasion is becoming undeniable. The question remains, why is the FDA doing this anyway? One clue emerges from a recent internal FDA memo brought to light by the Freedom of Information Act. A stray quote mentions that Summit complained to Senator Kennedy, who chaired the committee responsible for FDA oversight regarding the lack of FDA timeliness. Another clue emerges from a history of personal donations by Mueller, Doney, Krauss, and others in Summit to prominent politicians. American Investigator also discovered significant soft money donations to the DNC. Summit was operating in the red, yet their contributions rank among the highest in Massachusetts, higher than Revlon, for example. Curiously, a few local companies seem to follow Summit's lead in amounts, timing, even in one case the day of delivery. Company representatives deny any link. Ultimately, these clues can only go so far. Further explanations must emerge from insiders. And when American investigator interviewed James Fallon, he recalled a conversation with John Francis of Mueller's inner circle in the summer of 93. There was a lot of anxiety at the company during uh, my tenure at Summit. Uh, we were always asking what the status was, and one day I expressed my trepidation to uh, Mr. Francis, and he said, uh, I can assure you we're getting FDA approval. I said, how can you be so confident? He said, well, I have special knowledge. I said, could you go into greater detail? He said, well, confidentially, uh, Dave Mueller uh, recently met with Senator Kennedy on a Saturday in his town home in Washington and uh, petitioned him uh, for approval and helping uh, enlisting his support to help summit. Uh, he thought this was a great opportunity for Senator Kennedy because this would create a lot of high paying, high tech jobs for his constituents. Um, it would create uh, a dynamic financial structure uh, for Waltham, Massachusetts. Uh, after petitioning uh, Senator Kennedy uh, in this vein, uh, Senator Kennedy responded, F the jobs. I'm in the re-election campaign of my life. What I need, if you want approval, and I can get you approval, is a million dollars for my re-election campaign and a half a million dollars to the Democratic re-election committee. I asked Mr. Francis, I said, what happened next? He said, uh, Dave smiled, uh, opened uh, up his suit jacket and said, how do you want the checks made out? And Senator Kennedy says, don't even do that right now. My people will get back to you. Fallon has sworn these statements in an affidavit and claims others in the company could verify these statements. Shortly after the Kennedy meeting, Fallon says, the FDA came through on the deal. They were put on the fast track of PRK approval. Um, uh, it appeared uh, from our vantage point that Vizax was um, further behind than ever in its approval process and they actually had the early lead is it possible that John Francis exaggerated these numbers or maybe even got the story wrong? I felt Mr. Francis was a very, um, had a good grasp of business and numbers, amounts. Um, he told, he convinced me when he told me the story. The FDA has always presented itself as a pristine agency, and yet a new pattern is emerging. The FDA must answer the questions that are accumulating. I don't know. But I, I, uh, I think there's an awful lot of suspicious things that have happened and inappropriate things and unethical things. If they don't get the truth and they don't find the guilty party and they don't put in place procedures to minimize this happening again, 
there is no integrity in the review process at the FDA. I think the decisions are being made that uh, really threaten uh, lives uh, in this country and quality of life in this country. And uh, there seems to be no limiting them. Well, Ethan, let's uh, go back to the timing of when Senator Kennedy was supposed to assist Summit in getting this approval. If after the 1994 elections he was no longer chairman of the committee, how was he in a position to continue to assist them? Well, he continued to have a lot of power, but beyond that we found a Clinton connection as well. Uh, a, another highly credible source who wishes not to be named says that he remembers Mueller referring to private dinners at the White House explicitly. And uh, we have also have a second-hand source who claims that Mueller actually spent the night there. Now, that doesn't make any sense, but if you connect the dots, uh, the Washington Post recently published an article saying many backers spent night at the White House. These are high DNC donors, so you can begin to see a pattern here. Okay, it's time once again for a station break, but when American Investigator returns, you'll have the chance to question both reporters live. You can begin calling in now at 1-800-5000-NET, or you can fax us your questions and comments at 202-544-2405. Stay tuned. We'll be back after this. Live from the nation's capital, you're watching American Investigator. And welcome back to American Investigator, the only investigative program on television that allows the reporters to be questioned live. Let's go directly to the phone lines. You're on American Investigator. Uh, Paul, thanks for taking my call. What a great program. Um, is the head of the FDA a political appointee? Yes. Mm -hmm. cool. Yes, Mr. Kessler uh, actually served in the Bush administration, and at the end of the Bush administration, uh, he was very critical of the Bush administration's position on a number of issues, and uh, as a result, Bill Clinton agreed to retain him uh, in his current position. It was very obvious what he was doing. He was making a play for the uh, incoming, uh, or who he thought was going to be the incoming president. Well, and it certainly paid off for him now with all the tobacco, uh, the attack on the tobacco companies, which is you know, the, the hottest FDA issue right, right now. Kessler, of course, is leading the charge. Well, that's for sure. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, what kind of, of credibility uh, did you feel the various people that you interviewed, and I know you interviewed lots of people off camera who wouldn't talk, uh, but what, how did you feel about their credibility, the ones that the one on camera and the ones that didn't? What's interesting about this is that when people don't want to go on camera, you often trust them more, in a way, because you can understand why they don't want to go on camera. They don't want to ruin their name in the industry and so on. So, frankly, when James Fallon agreed to go on camera, I think we were a little concerned about it. However, he did, you know, he knew the players so well, and he suggested various people that I could call to verify the story with. Often those people would refuse to talk because they were still at, at Summit, but he couldn't necessarily know they weren't ready to talk. The other thing is we do have a second-hand source which apparently at one time did come out with Mueller's same story, a very similar story about the Kennedy uh, allegation. Not only that, I mean, we talked to these people more than once. We spent more than perhaps 30 minutes with, with each of these people. In the cases of the people uh, who were on camera, we spent hours with them. So by the time we were done, we felt that they were very credible people. Fallon was even willing to sign an affidavit to the fact um, that this rumor that he heard about Senator Kennedy was true, or that he in fact did hear it. So I mean, we felt that if he was willing to sign a legal document, uh, we, were, we felt very confident in what he had to say to us. Coming up. When American Investigator pointed out FDA corruption last year, the government promised thorough investigations. What happened? Okay, the FBI's had an investigation going. Did they contact you? Never. Barton's committee? Never. More American Investigator coming up. Stop. 
Dr. Muller, thank you for shifting your schedule. No problem. Our stock has fallen to $5 a share. From 35. Out of this kind of stuff now. Focus. On the stockholder lawsuit will implicate Kim and John. Okay. Be facing a future call from the FBI, let alone Barton's committee. There's already. an East Coast network and some papers are picking up. Okay, good. David, your leadership is perceived to be part of the problem. The company must focus on the bottom line. Um, mic check, Paul. This is NET, the political news talk network. Listen, I did what no one else could do. I got your FDA approval. Uh, can I grab a pen? Coming in on camera, too? This can be settled amicably, Dr. Muller. American investigator, Paul Wyrick. Good evening and welcome to American Investigator. Our report confirms what many of us often suspect, that a federal agency can be compromised by... On September 5th, 1996, Marianne, American Investigator's Eye on the FDA, exclusive, aired nationwide. A story of government and industrial espionage, it targeted Summit Technologies and its chairman, David Muller, as the culprits in a scheme to bribe the FDA for approval of their eye surgery laser. What we didn't know at the time was that a few hours earlier, the Summit Board had called an emergency meeting and fired Dr. Muller. Tonight, NET's chief investigator, Ethan Gutman, has a follow-up. Ethan? Thanks, Paul. A year ago, we hoped that the truth would out and the guilty would be punished. Well, the private sector may have had a kind of rough justice. After all, Mueller was fired and his cohorts left soon after. However, the aftershocks in the public sector were not quite what we were expecting. We'll start with a brief recap. The market, 80 million nearsighted Americans who want permanent vision correction. The competitors, Summit Technology of Massachusetts and Vizex of California, the manufacturers of the revolutionary XMR eye laser surgery machines. The law, the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, the agency which grants the competitors approvals or access to the market. He thought this was a great What happened? Start at the highest level. Whistleblower James Fallon, former Western sales manager for Summit, revealed that Summit chairman Dr. Mueller asked Senator Ted Kennedy to influence the FDA in favor of Summit. Kennedy asked for campaign contributions, and he got them. Follow up at the lower level. Kim Doney, Summit liaison to the FDA, developed an intimate relationship with Emma Knight, the FDA reviewer of Summit's laser. What emerged? Beyond Summit's swift approval, a dizzying pattern of favoritism. Summit pre-sold lasers illegally. The FDA turned a blind eye. Summit tested procedures on Navy SEALs, damaging their vision. The FDA accepted the results. Summit needed favorable status reports to bull up their stocks. The FDA provided. Summit needed to slow down Vizex's progress toward approval. The FDA reviewer of Vizex, Mark Stern, was fired. Finally, when Summit needed industrial espionage, the blueprints of Vizex's new laser, with Ammonite's fax header on them, made their way from the FDA to Mueller's doorstep. The last incident prompted an FDA internal investigation. If they don't get the truth, there is no integrity in the review process at the FDA. Simultaneously, Congressman Joe Barton, chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee, began preliminary hearings. We wrote to the Senate Ethics Committee. They assured us they were looking into it. Most significant, the FBI announced a probe. The government appeared set to uncover the truth. Following our broadcast, the press picked up the story. Dan Murphy of Investors Business Daily established that Kennedy had actually attended an additional fundraiser at Mueller's home. Rumors circulated of a summit payoff, as high as $5 million to Mueller in exchange for his silence. Almost a year later, we went to Waltham, Massachusetts to talk to Summit, but they still refused to comment. Summit's a bit of a shell company these days. They don't produce many lasers, for example. These days, Summit's biggest strength may be their continuing silence. Why? 
Well, just by continuing to exist, Summit stands to reap $50 million in royalties this coming year. And who's out there making sure they receive that money? You guessed it, the FDA. Usually uh, a doctor buys medical equipment from a medical equipment supplier. He takes it, he owns it, he uses it. In this instance, whether he buys it from Summit or he buys it from Vizex, he takes it home and now has to pay $250 every time he uses it. It's called the Pillar Point Royalty, and it's the big money in this story. It essentially says... John Alioto is taking it to the Federal Trade Commission. For doctors to operate on an eye, one little card must be fed to the machine. Cost of a card, $250. And it doesn't matter if the machine is Summit or Vizex, because they're splitting the profits. All kinds of things happen there, you know. Mark Logan, president of Vizex, says it's not price fixing. No, no, not at all. But either way, the FDA is enforcing it. Good, you're doing great. We're almost done with this eye. We've got four, three, four. For Dr. Ellis of San Francisco, the FDA is never very far away. He is the key figure among a handful of eye surgeons that have been extremely vocal about FDA corruption and FDA intrusion into surgical practice. Ellis is also a pioneer in refractive surgery with three textbooks to his credit. Okay, we're going to fire the laser. 49 pulses. But according to the FDA, what he's doing here is illegal. Why? Look closely. Although it's a standard Summit machine made in America just like hundreds of others, this machine was slated for the British market and it has no card slot. No card, no charge to his patients. And, Ellis claims, no accidents. The question with these devices, are they safe? Do they put out the power? Uh, are they going to fail? That's what you look at in device approval. When the eye laser scandal broke, Anxious FDA officials seem suddenly willing to legalize Dr. Ellis's laser. Send us your names and addresses and the serial numbers and we'll certify. Well, what happened was a cruel hoax because instead of certifying, within nine months, FDA turned around and said, we're dropping the certification program. And by the way, we've got all of your names now and please stop using the laser. This was no idle request. Following the June warning letter to the doctors, the FDA seized $4 million worth of uncertified machines in Florida. Devices worth hundreds of thousands of dollars were suddenly worthless. The FDA even set up a special snitch line to coax doctors into reporting medical complications from uncertified lasers. In the recent condemnation of the imported and the custom-made machines, the FDA has said that the Omnicard and is essentially, as I read this, medically, safety-wise, required. And that's really going the, the full nine yards for the price-fixing arrangement. Okay, Tom, this won't hurt. The fact is, when Dr. Ellis performs an operation, Vizex and Summit don't realize any profits. It's a major business now. Mark Logan admitted that the saturation point for the U.S. market is 500 lasers perhaps a billion dollars. But the pillar point royalty profits are at least 10 times that. But Logan claims his main concern is preventing an accident that will lessen public acceptance of eye surgery. And suddenly, you know, we get a, a documentary that says this is, or, or a new, a, worse yet, a, an investigative a, piece. A, <laughs> an investigative piece uh, you know, but, but nightly news, 15 seconds or, or less of this terrible incident without saying, whoa, this is a, laser that was not approved, uh, and we get tired with the same brush. Right. Let's look at a certified machine that the FDA says is totally safe. Dr. George Simon of Omaha, Nebraska tells us of a recent incident with his summit machine while a patient was in the middle of surgery. My technician read off 100, 125, stop, the machine stopped. The operation was only two-thirds complete. Somehow, to Dr. Simon's horror, the little card had signaled that the operation was over. Simon rushed to insert yet another $250 card into the slot to deliver the remaining pulses. My fear at that time was enough time had elapsed between the initiation of the surgery 
and the continuation of the surgery that the patient's cornea had now been desiccated or dried significantly and the results of the remaining procedure were going to be different from what we had anticipated. And sure enough, they were. Uh, <clears throat> two or three months after the procedure, the patient was still significantly farsighted in that eye. I can't understand why the FDA caused the, the debit card to be necessary on the machine. Debit card doesn't have anything whatsoever to do with the functioning of the machine other than, as you noticed, to uh, uh, cause an abortion of the procedure. Dr. Simon is not alone. A Summit Technology representative admitted that other Summit machines have frozen up across the U.S. because of that little card. The FDA's actions, then, are somewhat inexplicable. Is the FDA really concerned with safety or with money? or with curbing Dr. Ellis and his group. And now, you see, look at we asked John Aliotto why, if there was a safety issue with the imported lasers, the FDA waited nine months to send their cease and desist order. Why did the FDA release this letter only recently? I think that the heat was off. But who is the heat on? We went to Los Angeles to see James Fallon, the summit whistleblower who'd established the critical Kennedy connection. Did anyone in the media contact you about the story? I've been contacted by no less than three dozen uh, industry sources, uh, ranging from the Wall Street Journal, their Boston, New York, uh, Washington, and LA offices, uh, the Boston Globe, the LA Times, uh, Investors Daily, and numerous industry publications such as Oculus Surgery News, Ophthalmology Times, FDA Review, approximately three dozen uh, national publications. Okay, which um, government agencies contacted you? How about the FDA Office of uh, Internal Affairs, for example? I've never been contacted by that uh, department. Did Senator Kennedy's office contact you? Never. Okay, the FBI's had an investigation going. Did they contact you? Never. Barton's committee? Never. The Senate Ethics Committee? Never. Okay, no government agency has contacted you? The only government agency that has contacted me has been the Internal Revenue Service. Mr. Fallon's first ever audit is for 1994, the last year he worked for Summit Technology, and the year he applied for whistleblower protection. Donald Alexander, former IRS commissioner, thought certain items in Fallon's returns could have tripped the IRS computer, rendering a one in five chance of actually being audited. Other tax experts estimated the probability of Fallon's audit closer to one in 150. If you think these are unlikely odds, consider this. The Wall Street Journal article was around the 13th of January. On the 23rd of January, I received an audit request. And it was a very broad audit request. They wanted all my papers, all my documents, all my, uh, the type of an audit request that I haven't had before. And Dr. Garibet, a very a prominent surgeon in our group in Los Angeles, also came under tax audit. We wonder why a small group of surgeons who have been so influential in bringing out uh, these discrepancies and irregularities should all come under tax audit at once. Why have all the whistleblowers and all the major uh, personalities that have identified this type of uh, illegal activity all been audited all within the exact same time frame. Um, gee, uh, that would be like hitting the lottery uh, three weeks in a row. Bill Sardi of Ophthalmology Journal actually predicted the audits last fall. Was he clairvoyant or just familiar with the recent IRS pattern of political audits? The IRS doesn't grant interviews, so we went to the former IRS historian, Shelley Davis, author of Unbridled Power. There are no records. That was my main discovery as their first, last, and only historian, is they've literally shredded their entire paper trail throughout this entire century. So when you have no smoking gun, no needle in the haystack, you can't prove anything. We asked Davis if we should invoke the Freedom of Information Act. Suppose I were to do a FOIA request to the IRS. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to laugh. <sighs> well, in a, maybe, maybe five years you might receive a response. You know. I urge the nation... During JFK's administration, the IRS developed the notorious Ideological Organizations Audit Project. 
Auditing has long been in the Kennedy family's playbook. But a well-placed source on Capitol Hill felt that this was too risky for a senator like Ted Kennedy. And the FDA had more to lose. Or did an agent simply pick the names out of the newspapers? They're not going to tell you that they had a call from a senator's office. They're not going to tell you that the commissioner directed them to do this. But they're going to go out and do it. And we'll never know exactly what prompted that. The IRS definitely has the power to do it. So if another federal agency, in this case the FDA, was savvy enough to figure out that pulling in the IRS to go after their whistleblowers was a good way to do it, there's absolutely nothing in place to stop it from happening. And that's the most important point, is there's nothing in place to stop the IRS from targeting individuals for audit for political reasons, for personal reasons, for reasons that have nothing to do with their tax returns. One thing can be proven. There was no legitimate investigation of the FDA by any government agency. The Senate Ethics Committee spoke to David Mueller, who denied giving a bribe, and to Kennedy's office, who denied taking it. And, in the absence of any evidence to the contrary, closed the investigation. Congressman Barton and his committee chose to defer to the FBI's investigation at a time of increasing concern over the FBI becoming politicized. As for the FBI probe, well, the FBI still hasn't closed their investigation, but apparently has spoken to only one actual witness. Did he contact you? I contacted the agent. The FBI agent listened patiently to FDA whistleblower Mark Stern and took names. Two months ago, he told Mark Stern not to call him again. The agent never called Mark Logan or James Fallon. Is there a deliberate attempt not to investigate? Do you think there are people out there who might talk? If they were called to testify and given immunity, I think uh, everything I've said would be supported and validated in greater detail. Are you comfortable talking about this? Some of it. I just think that uh, there are some very powerful forces at work here that, uh, that might infringe on my personal uh, life, and I don't want that. I have a family, and I'm concerned about them. I think this is endemic. I think this is business as usual. We brought it out, we've exposed it, and nobody wants to listen to it. The FDA laser scandal is evidenced by flawed approvals, stolen documents, acts that tear at the very heart of the FDA's legitimacy, and it implicates individuals up and down the FDA chain of command. A confidential source told American Investigator that David Mueller's parting shot was to tell the summit board more about the FDA approval process than they wanted to hear. Question, does the FDA's continued health depend on Mueller being appeased? Is Summit a collaborator? Is the FDA being blackmailed? We stick to what we know and what we can prove. We see only surface features, clues to the tectonic structure beneath us. When we dug a little into the FDA laser scandal, we may have created stress along a hidden fault line that runs along several agencies, the FBI, the IRS, possibly even Congress. We felt a brief tremor. Yet in the absence of the political will to dig, and dig deeply, ultimately there will be no solid ground. That concludes our final report. Our phone lines are open at 1-800-5000-NET. Our fax number, 202-544-4132. Our email address is ai at fcref dot o-r-g. Ethan, any closing comments? Just one, Paul. Everyone who interviewed in our previous show agreed to a follow-up interview, except for Congressman Barton. He has also refused to meet Dr. Ellis and his group. A committee staffer claims Barton is still interested in full hearings into the eye laser scandal. The question then is, why wait a year, and why not talk to a reporter who will bring attention to the problem? Ethan, uh, what is Emma Knight's status at the FDA at this point? Well, here's something good that the Barton committee did come up with which is that she has been given a flexible workplace agreement by the FDA. That consists of a home computer that's paid for by taxpayer expense and so on, printer, modem, and dedicated phone lines. Now, this is a woman who is under FBI investigation for possibly leaking million-dollar documents 
to a competitor, to a, a company out there. And uh, I don't understand this, except that it may fit in with some kind of blackmail theory. Hmm. All right, let's uh, ask our viewers to begin joining us here on American Investigator. Gary in Carthage, Missouri, welcome to the program. Uh, Paul, thank you for taking my call. Ethan, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, the lady that uh, was a historian for the uh, uh, Internal Revenue, had, uh, has she ever been audited? I'll just hang up and listen to your answer. Okay. Uh, actually, I, I don't think she ever has been audited. Uh, she has run into some, I know she ran into some serious trouble with the IRS. In fact, they talked about handcuffing her to the building when she made a public appearance there on tax day. But uh, I'm not actually sure about her tax status. Uh, Ethan, do you think that uh, Congressman Barton really backed off of his investigation because of the FBI involvement in all of this? Well, Paul, I mean, he knows, Congressman Barton knows as well as you and I uh, that the FBI is showing strong signs of becoming politicized. Uh, and this is a really hard question to answer, except that I know that I am not the first person who has told the main staffer in charge of this investigation that the FBI called none of the witnesses. And every time he's told that, he expresses surprise. Okay, let's ask Robert in Orlando, Florida to join us here on American Investigator. Uh, yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for accepting my call. I have this one question. What is the probability of something like this happening again? <laughs> now it sounds like it's pretty good from what you've just said. Uh, it depends on which, I'm not sure which the question is referring to, if you're speaking to uh, the probability of people being audited like this again, I think that's very high. Uh, the probability of something like this happening, a scandal like this happening at the FDA also seems high because the same people are there. Uh, nobody's been fired, not even a sacrificial lamb like Emma Knight in this case. Do you think that uh, this investigation will ever go anywhere? It's hard to summarize this case, isn't it? Uh, I don't say this very often, but I'd have to say I don't think this is going to go anywhere. I think that uh, Barton's committee, we've got a really sad tale here of uh, obvious government corruption, and we've got a Republican Congress which is sitting back and letting it happen. Okay, well that's all the time we have for tonight's episode of American Investigator. As always, we welcome your faxes at 202-544-4132 and your emails at fcref.org. For the American Investigator team, I'm your host, Paul Wyrick, from your nation's capital. Have a great evening.